Thanks for tuning in to Christ Fellowship Church on YouTube. We're so blessed that you've chosen to take some time out of your day to spend it with us. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. Well, hey, church family, my name is Ryan, and I'm excited to open the Word of God together today. The last time that I got to share with you, I was coming to you from a tent <laughs> in my backyard with my whole family. And I just wanna take a moment and clear up a little bit of confusion, because I got a lot of questions about that message, not really so much about what I said, but about the tent. And so I just wanna make sure you understand. Number one, yes, we really did spend 33 nights in that tent, okay? They weren't all consecutive, but we were out there 33 nights during quarantine. And listen, I'm only slightly offended that some of you thought I would just make that number up and lie to you, okay? I'm, I'm here to tell you the truth. The second thing I wanna make sure you understand is we're not homeless. <laughs> so while I appreciate all of the calls and the text messages and the well wishes, we don't need the GoFundMe, okay? We're, we're doing okay. We're just out there having a good time with our family because we love to camp. And I think one of the things I really like about camping is that you kind of get to disconnect from everything, even if it's only in the backyard. You kind of get to disconnect and, and you really only bring when you go camping, that was is absolutely essential, right? You only bring with you that which is absolutely essential. Now there's a word that the meaning has changed quite a bit in the last few months, essential. I want you to understand what the definition of the word essential means. It's this. It means absolutely necessary. It means indispensable. Now, it's interesting because in this last season of life, many of us have started evaluating our lives by these words or filtering our decisions through the lens of essential versus non-essential. We've been thinking about activities and businesses and in some cases, even people as essential or non-essential. And I think as things start to return to some kind of normal, I think it's right, I think it's appropriate, I think it's good for us to take some time and to consider what is truly essential. Because there are some things in my life in this last season that have been cut out that I don't wanna come back. There are some things in my life, some habits and routines and some disciplines that I've, I've built in that I wanna make sure that as we get back to some sort of normal that I hold on to those things. I wanna take this moment and evaluate what in my life is truly essential. I think it's true in terms of faith too. I mean, what's really essential about our faith? As I consider that question, there's a conversation in Matthew chapter 22 that comes to mind for me. Here's what the Bible says. I want you to understand at this moment that Jesus is, is teaching to different groups of people all of the time. And one of the groups that he's teaching to is a group called the Sadducees, okay? They're the religious elite. And so Jesus is, is teaching them. And the Bible says that they are amazed by all that he has to say, okay? So here, we're gonna pick up the scripture in Matthew chapter 22. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they got together and one of them who was an expert in the law tested him, talking about Jesus, with this question, okay? So Jesus, as he's teaching, is literally silencing some of the objections to him. That word in scripture, it actually means muzzled, okay? So that's pretty cool. Jesus muzzled those who were objecting to his teachings. And so in this moment, what we see is an expert in the law is about to try and trick Jesus, now, what's interesting is all throughout the New Testament, we see people trying to trap Jesus or trick Jesus or get him to say something. And it's interesting to me that they just keep trying that because it, it never seems to work. They haven't figured out, they haven't learned. You can't trick Jesus. So the scripture continues, it says this, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, when he uses the phrase, the law, this expert is actually referring to the 613 laws contained within the pages of the Old Testament. The 613 laws that instructed men and women of God how they ought to live. And so he goes, if you had to boil it all down to just one thing, what would it be? If you know a little bit about the Bible, they might've been thinking at this moment, well, maybe Jesus is gonna go with one of the top 10, you know, the big 10, we know those. But he doesn't do that. Here's the way that Jesus responds. Scripture says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This 
is the first and greatest commandment. Now, in reality, no one would have been surprised in this moment about what Jesus has just said to them. Nobody would have been surprised. What Jesus is actually doing in this moment is he's quoting scripture. This is from Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five. Jesus is quoting scripture. It's part of something that is referred to in Judaism as the Shema, okay? And actually they would have known it because faithful men and women of God, they would have said these words every morning and every night in their prayers, okay? So these are, these are words from scripture that they are very, very familiar with. But now you gotta remember something. Jesus was asked what he said was the greatest commandment, no S. They asked him to boil it all down to just one commandment. And they were expecting maybe that he would even use these words. But Jesus, he doesn't stop there. He actually adds to this, he continues, he adds another and here's what he says, don't miss it. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and all of the prophets, they hang on these two commandments. All of the law and all of the prophets, they hang on these two commandments. Now, let me tell you what is absolutely essential to our faith. You wanna know what is essential? Our love for God. Our love for God is absolutely essential, right? We cannot possibly overstate it. We are told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength or mind. We are told that we are to love God above anything and everything else. I've heard it said that we ought to love God with our affection, with our attention and with our action, right? We are to love God with everything we are. It should be all consumed. But you know what else is essential? Our love for people. Our love for people is absolutely essential because here's, here's what the teacher of the law is really asking Jesus. What he's saying is, Lord, what is the most essential commandment? What is the absolutely necessary commandment? What is the indispensable commandment? And you know what Jesus says? Jesus says it is that you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. So what is essential? Our love for God and our love for people. See, what he's trying to help them understand is that all of the law has to be, listen to me, understood through the lens of love. If you don't look at it through the lens of love, you don't get it at all. That's why he says that all of the law and all of the prophets, they hang on or hinge on these two commandments. So so what he's saying is that the 613 laws of the Old Testament, they hinge on or they hang on these two. So those, these two commandments of love, the door of obedience to God hinges on them. The door to obedience to God hinges on our love for him and our love for others. So you cannot, I cannot, we cannot fulfill the law of God without love. See, Jesus is trying to help these Experts, (laughs) Experts, <laughs> these religious people understand that it all comes down to love. That is what it's really all about. And I, and I think people get hung up here a little bit when they hear the word second, because second, we don't like second, you know? You wanna be first. <laughs> first is the best, right? First is the most important. And I think sometimes we get hung up on the word second, right? He says, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he says, the second is like it. So we automatically think that what Jesus has just said is more important, right? That our love for God is more important than our love for people. But Jesus doesn't let us off the hook with this one. When he says the second is like it, what he's saying is the second is the same. It has the same weight. It has the same significance. It has the same importance. What he's saying is that how we love others is just as important as the way that we love God. See, we cannot understand this as two separate commandments, but rather this is one essential commandment. 
love God and love people. How do we know this? How do we actually know this to be true, that that's what Jesus means when he instructs us about the essential commandment? There's a scripture in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 that says this. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother, whoever does not love their sister whom they can see, cannot love God whom they have not seen. What does that mean? <laughs> well, if you're paying attention, this one should hurt a little bit. <laughs> Because what the Bible actually tells us is that if we claim to love God, but we hate our brothers and sisters, we don't actually love God. Now, before you send nasty emails about me, you know, uh, I, I just want you to understand, these are not my words. This is what the word of God says, that if we claim to love God and yet we hate a brother or sister, then we, we do not love God. So, so let me as gently and as gracefully as I possibly can say it another way. I only love God as much as the person I hate the most. You wanna know how much I love God? Look at the way I love people. We have to learn to evaluate our love for God based on our love for people. We cannot separate the two. They are indispensable. They are essential. This is what you and I are called to, to love God and to love people. Well, what about the people who hurt me? What about the people I find offensive? What about the people who don't believe the same things as me? What about the people who posted that on Facebook? What about the people who, we can start to ask all of these questions. What about them and what about them? Surely God, you don't want me to love them. Surely God, I'm off the hook with those people or with that person. Surely God, you don't mean to love them. This same conversation is also recorded in the book of Luke. Okay, we don't just read about it in Matthew chapter 22. We also read about it in Luke chapter 10. It's the same conversation. But there we read this man's follow-up question to what Jesus has just said. So he goes, okay, Jesus, what's the most essential commandment? Jesus says, we gotta love God and you gotta love people. And he does what some of us just did. Well, what about, well, you can't mean Here's what he asked Jesus. Pay attention. Listen, this is very, very important. This reveals why this, this essential commandment is so challenging. Here's his question. But he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to justify the actions or the inactions of his life. He wanted to justify the way that he was living because he instantly knew that what Jesus was sharing was incompatible with the way he had been living. What he was experiencing was conviction. And so, so he says, uh, wanting to justify himself, he asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? What he's really driving at is like, the question is, are there people that I don't have to love? Are there people that I'm off the hook for? And that's when Jesus begins to tell him a story. Maybe you're familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan. That's the backdrop for this story that Jesus tells. And what he says is that one day there was a traveler who was making his way from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as he traveled, he was attacked on the road. He was beaten, he, he was robbed, they took everything from him and he was left for dead on the side of the road, the Bible says. Well, as this man is lying down in a ditch, people began to walk by. The first two people in the story that Jesus tells who walk by are amongst the same people that Jesus is talking to right now, the religious leaders, the people who have it all together, the people who have it figured out. And what do they do when they see someone in need? Don't miss it. They turn around and they walk the other way. Bible actually says they cross to the other side of the street. They literally ignore this man's deep need, his, his wounds. He, he, they just ignore him and they cross to the other side of the street. Finally, in the story that Jesus tells, there's a third man who comes along. This man is from Samaria. 
And we already know if you've been in church the last couple of weekends, this is a, uh, there are two different groups of people happening right now in this moment in time that Jesus is talking about, okay? The Jews and the Samaritans, and they don't get along at all, okay? They're from different sides of the tracks, okay? There is racial tension that exists between these two different people groups, okay? And so in the story that Jesus tells, it's the third person, it's the Samaritan. It's literally the least likely person in the story to actually do something about this man's situation because of all the tension that exists between them, because there is hate between their two different cultures. And what Jesus says is that this man, the Samaritan, instead, he climbs down into the ditch. He gets his hands dirty. He cares for this man. He bandages his wounds. He picks him up. He gets him on a donkey. He gets him to the care that he needs. He pays for his medical bills. He leaves him in the care of the innkeeper. He does all of these things. And Jesus asked the question, which of these was a neighbor to the man who was attacked? And we all know the answer, right? We all know who was the neighbor. We all know which person did the right thing. When you see someone in need, you help. There's literally laws in our country called the Good Samaritan Laws that will punish people who don't step in and do something when they see someone being hurt or attacked. So we all know what's the right thing to do. And so these religious people, they're kind of left stumped, confused. They know the answer that Jesus is seeking. What he's saying to them in this moment is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where somebody comes from. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what mistakes they made. It doesn't matter. You love them. Who's your neighbor? Yes. <laughs> Is that person my neighbor? Yes. Is that person my neighbor? Yes. Everyone is our neighbor. Jesus is not referring to people who are close in proximity. He's talking about man and woman, like everyone, humankind. We are called to love them. They are our neighbors. Now, Jesus says this in this passage of scripture. He says, now go and do likewise. Go and do likewise in the same way that this man loved someone that he shouldn't have loved by society standards. In the same way that this man chose at great expense to himself to climb down into the ditch and to help this hurting man go, he says, and do the same. What Jesus is doing is he's painting a picture of what it looks like to love our neighbor as ourselves. And who is our neighbor? Very simply, according to Jesus, the answer is everyone. Everyone is our neighbor. We don't get to pick and choose. The essence of our faith is that we will love God and that we will love people. Now, this is challenging for me. It's challenging for all of us if we're honest. And the only way that we can truly begin to love others the way that we are called to love them is by understanding the way that we have been loved by God. God who first loved us. We must understand how God has loved us if we are ever to love others the way that we have been called to love them. If you've been around church for a while, you probably know that in the original language of the New Testament, there are several words for love and they all have different meanings. Some refer to brotherly love, some refer to relational love, like between a man and a, uh, a wife, some refer to different kinds of love. But the love of God, as we read about in scripture, is most often the word agape. And maybe you've heard that before. What agape means is this, it means unconditional love. Love without reservation, love without condition, unconditional love. Now it's interesting. In this passage of scripture, this, this story in Matthew chapter 22, here's what Jesus says. He says, love the Lord your God. And you know what word he uses there? He uses the word agape, which means unconditional love. He says, love the Lord your God without condition. And most people would go, okay, Jesus, I got that. I understand what you mean. 
I, I know that I am called to love God first and foremost above all else. I know that I'm called to love God unconditionally. But when Jesus goes to the second commandment and he instructs us to love others as we love ourselves, do you know what word he uses there? I'll tell you what word I want him to use there. I want him to use friendly love, brotherly love. I want him to use some kind of lesser love. But you know what Jesus does? He says that we love others as ourselves. He uses that same word, agape, unconditional love. So what does that mean? We're actually called to love people in the very same way that we love God, that we would love others without reservation, without condition. That is how we are called to love people. See, Jesus doesn't let us off the hook in this passage of scripture, but we have to learn to love others the way that we have been loved. Because the truth is, that God loves you in a way that we really could never understand or imagine. The truth is that God's love for you knows no bounds. The truth is that God loves you without reservation or condition. The Bible actually tells us this about God's love in Romans chapter five, verse eight, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we still were, fill in the blank. <laughs> while we were still angry, while we were still cut off, while we were still aggressive, while we were still a jerk, you know, like while we still were sinners, God demonstrates His love for us in that He died for us while we still were. That means without reservation, without condition, Christ gave His life for us. And what Scripture says is that there is no greater love than one who would lay His life down for His friends. See, when I understand the way that I have been loved, it changes the way that I love God and others. When I understand that God loved me when I didn't agree with Him, when I didn't share his beliefs, when I didn't share in his perspective, when I couldn't offer him anything, God loved me anyway. You know, as you think about that story in Luke chapter 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it is in part about how we ought to love others. But it's about something else too. And, and you'll miss the reason that we ought to love others until you understand what this parable that Jesus is telling is really all about. Because most of the time when we look at scripture, if you're trying to understand a story in the Bible, most of the time we're not the hero of the story. I actually have to look at this parable that Jesus tells and go, okay, who am I in this story? And while sometimes I turn my head and I look the other way, when people are in need. While sometimes I fail to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves, while sometimes I fail to speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves. And while sometimes maybe I get it right and I help when I see people in need and while sometimes maybe I love people the way that Jesus would want me to, who I really am in this story, I'm the one in the ditch. I am the one who's been beaten, bruised, and left for dead. If I wanna figure out who I am in this story, that's where I am. I lie in a poor and helpless estate and there is nothing that I can do on my own to get back up on my feet, right? To get back up on my way. But listen to me, Jesus is the one who took it upon himself right, at great expense to himself to step out of heaven and into history so that he could climb down into the ditches of our lives. That's what Jesus is doing. He is the great Samaritan, okay? He set aside the rights and privileges of heaven. And when we couldn't offer him anything, when we couldn't do anything for him, when there should have been tension between us, Jesus instead steps out of heaven and into history. He's climbing down into the ditches of our lives. See, when Jesus walked this earth and lived a perfectly sinless life, 
He did that so that ultimately He could give that life up for you and I on a cross. Because the beauty of the gospel story is that Jesus, He died a death that He did not deserve so that you and I could inherit a life that we don't deserve. He loved us while we were still sinners. And until I experience the love of God in the person of Jesus Christ, I will never love Him or others the way that I am called to. Before you start trying to figure out how to love others better, it's important. But you gotta start with understanding the way that God has loved you. And so I wanna give you the opportunity today, wherever you're joining in from, if you've never began that relationship with God through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus, if you've never allowed Jesus to, to pick you up and to bandage your wounds, to bring you back to healing and wholeness, if you've never allowed Jesus to begin to care for your life as only He can, today is the day you can say, I want that, I want that relationship. You can cry out to Jesus today and guess what? He will step down into the ditch of your life and pick you up, give you the life and the hope and the purpose and the destiny that He has for you. And so if that's you today and you don't have a relationship with God, but you would say, I want that. I want that. And I wanna just invite you wherever you are, just say, Lord Jesus, help me. <laughs> Calling out to you today, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new again. And for the rest of my days, as best as I know how, I will live to honor you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thanks so much for watching Christ Fellowship Church on YouTube. We hope that you've enjoyed this week's message. For more content just like this, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope you have a great rest of your week. God bless.